Stu, in trying to figure out how reality makes any sense and looking at science and looking at the way science works, uh, we can make progress, but really only to a point. And then, you know, I stop and really seeing real progress. You've taken it further. You've seen new ways, the way the world's organized in, in uh, chemistry and in the biosphere. I want to understand that. I want to understand how deep the principles that you've worked on really affect reality. It's a stunning question. Um, let's start with reductionism. And, and so we have since Newton to Einstein to Schrodinger to string theory, the search for an entailing law that mm -hmm. will entail everything that happens. Correct. Mm -hmm. It's a gorgeous dream. It is, in fact, a transmogrification of, of monotheism. <laughs> Instead of a single god that does it, there's a single law that does it. Mm -hmm. It's outside of the universe. Um, it's possible that it will work in physics. Possible. Except for the fact that they can't explain why the universe is complex so far. Um, God bless, may, may it work. But, as my friend Giuseppe Longo rightly says, in physics you can pre-state the phase space by symmetries. You can always do it, and the trajectories are always geodetics. This is his language, namely least action principles. Giuseppe and I both say that in the biosphere, you cannot pre-state the phase space, uh, and it's always changing. Therefore, we say, there is no law in the sense of entailed law. That's this, really radical. That's absolutely radical. I mean, it means, if we're right, that, that Newton, after 350 years, has reached a terminus. This is huge, but a lot of people better look at it and criticize it. And it also makes reductionism, where you can explain everything in terms of physics, impossible. It, it won't give us how the biosphere or the economy evolves, or culture evolves. But I keep finding order, and I keep finding organization, and there seems to be a deep principle that has to do with something like a system with many parts and many processes where the parts and the processes can interact with one another, and out of that emerges a kind of crystallization of organized parts and processes that, that then do something useful. So examples are my own theory of the emergence of life as the emergence of collectively autocatalytic sets of polymers, say small peptides, which has been done experimentally. So what, what does that mean? Well, it, it means that you have a set of small proteins that catalyze one another's formation. Speeds them up. Speeds them up, but yeah, that's what catalysis is. Um, and it's collectively autocatalytic. It falls out from a picture of the kind that I gave you. Lots of parts, lots of processes. The parts can speed up the processes, wham. Same thing in an economy uh, where you make new goods and services forever, which may give us the stable growth that we've got 2% a year for the past 70 years in the first world. The first world economy is super critical. My bet is the reason that we have 2% growth a year stably for 70 years is precisely that we can make new goods and services, and it's the same transition. Okay, I think that these are laws, and they're not laws that are entailing laws at all in, in the way that reductionism works. In fact, they're not even reducible to, reduc to, to physics. They're not reducible to physics. They're some new kind of principle of organization in complex holes that emerge out of lots of parts and lots of processes talking to one another. Origin of life. Uh, my Boolean net models of, of genetic regulatory networks, which gave rise to, uh, well, it's part of the intellectual foundations of systems biology, where once again, collective behaviors emerge um, by chance and number. The principles are chance and number, and, and, and some additional principles that are uh, not entailing laws, they're enabling laws. And this, as you've said, puts a, a ceaseless creativity into the structure of reality, so much so that you've called ceaseless creativity your God? Yes. And, are you, are and, you serious about that? Yeah. So, well, I don't believe in a supernatural God. 
But more, I think we need something that... But you feel compelled to call the ceaseless creativity that comes out of your whole uh, uh, theories, you want to use the word God to talk about that. And you don't do it facetiously, you do it quite I seriously. Do it. I do it completely earnestly. So, in the case in which the emergence of a swim bladder in evolution constitutes a new adjacent possible ecological niche, where selection acted in a population of fish to make a Jim Dandy swim bladder, selection did not operate to make the new adjacent possible empty niche that the swim bladder constitutes. Yet that swim bladder is a new direction of possible evolution of the biosphere. So the biosphere is building without selection its own possibilities of future becoming. And I find this just mind-blowing. That's radical emergence. And if one needs a sense of God in the creativity of the world, this is not Spinoza's naturan, nat natur naturans, the mm. deterministic becoming of an almost, an almost Cartesian universe. It's not Einstein. It's a ceaseless creativity. Ceaseless creativity you know, as my, my colleague Gordon Kaufman, uh, the theologian at Harvard with whom I taught, said in, in a beautiful book called In Face of Mystery. We're in face of mystery here. God is the face of mystery. And I think part of why we need God is not just that we want God to uh, make it rain here so our crops will grow. Of course we wanted that. I think we need God because we live in face of mystery. Not only do we not know what will happen, like when you flip a coin 10,000 times, but we know what can happen. In reality, we don't even know what can happen. We need an orienting principle and an orienting ethic to live in the civilization that we will create that I hope abets the creativity of human beings. So much is at stake. And I feel that around this creativity that we haven't seen is a new way of being in the world. It's not the way of being in the world of humanist secularism, which is Newtonian. It's much more bewitched. <laughs> it's bewitched. It's amazing. That's why you call it reinventing the sacred. Yes. So bringing it all together with a refutation of reductionism, with the ceaseless creativity in the universe being your God, how do you look upon it all? First, I'm more confident of a ceaseless creativity in the biosphere and life, where I think reductionism does fail. I think we are at a terminus of Newton's sway 350 years later. Second, I guess that I do want to be cautious. I think the physicist may succeed. There may be a theory, quotes of everything, okay, that explains physics. There may be something very special about Kantian holes where the parts exist foreign by means of the holes and the holes are performed by means of the parts that give rise to this stunning creativity and emergence that we're talking about. I don't know yet. I do think that there are new laws of self-organization that we're beginning to probe. Uh, for example, the subcritical, supercritical transition, when you have a sufficient number of parts and processes that can undergo reactions, but speed up those reactions, whether it's uh, building blocks in an economy that are the inputs and outputs of a production function, but the hammer and the nail are themselves the products, or whether it's catalysis speeding up a chemical reaction. I think there are all kinds of new laws, but they're not entailing laws about the detailed becoming of anything. I don't know what to call them, Robert. The, we don't have a name for them. And I do, I do want to say something else that, that I know how to use the words for, but I don't know what I mean. It's the word enabling. The, the, the swim bladder, once it exists, enables the becoming of the worm that lives in the swim bladder. It doesn't cause it, it enables mm -hmm. it. 
the law of the corporation enables the corporation to do what corporations do, including credit default swaps or, you know, whatever. Okay. Um, we do not understand in the biosphere. We do not understand in the economy. We do not understand in cultural life how what we do enables what comes next, which enables what comes next in a succession of adjacent possibles that we ourselves partially choose and partially arise organically. I don't know how to think about this. I know it's fundamental. Do I think there's laws about it? I don't think there's entailing laws about it. But there are clues that there might be statistical laws. I'll just give one example. If you were to ask an economic historian, uh, please tell me the the pattern of, uh, for example, patents that are formed that depend upon one another. You get some network of how patents give rise to the possibilities of new patents give rise to, right? Mm -hmm. sure. The statistical structure of that graph is certainly analyzable, even if we can't say what the inventions were. Can we hope to have them? Mm -hmm. Yes. Will they be entailing? No. Will they be laws? I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't know. So I think that what's beginning to happen is that as we move away from physics as the queen of the sciences, uh, which it is, it's spectacular, we're beginning to find new senses of law and, and we don't know where it's going to go, which is kind of wonderful. It's mm -hmm. worth being confused.